This is The Future of Money, a podcast where we hope to educate and get educated about the new world of blockchain and digital money. And my name is Eric Denbor, and I will be your host. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the blockchain and the future of money. Today, we will actually continue talking our talk about metaverse. I I'll, I'll guess I call it metaverse part three. And today we have with us Dr. Jeff Mullins and Dan Conway. And uh, so before we start, just give us a quick intro. Uh, Jeff, who are you? Where do you come from? What do you like? So uh, thanks for having me on the on the podcast today. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the uh, uh, University of Arkansas in the Department of Information Systems in the Walton College of Business. Um, I study the convergence of work and play, uh, which, you know, as we're using game engines to build new experiences, as we're using devices that were and, and techniques that were pre previously associated with games to, to bring people into uh, simulated environments for training and things like that, it's, it's really interesting how these worlds are converging. Uh, and so I, I study a lot of that. Um, and I teach database courses. And, you know, we're going to have to manage data in the metaverse, too. Yeah, and we were talking about VRs and stuff like that in, in the previous podcast. Mm -hmm. So make sure to go and watch it if you haven't watched it. Definitely. Dan, what about you? I am Dan Conway. I also work with the university. I'm involved in the Blockchain Center. And um, I'm trying to think of something interesting to say about myself. Um, oh, there's a lot of interesting <laughs> things to say about you. Um, I've I learned a lot from the people around me, and I'm surrounded by good good people around me. I'm probably my background's more in analytics and artificial intelligence, but I've been in blockchain for a number of years. Yeah, and you've been, you've been doing some very interesting jobs. I, I know there was some FBI stuff in the past also. We're not going to go there. No, no. Not this time, but may, maybe in a future podcast. How about that? So today, we were going to continue talking about metaverse. But this time, I was thinking that maybe we should talk about a little bit more about the hardware and also like um, the, 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 the speed of internet and stuff like that. So let's start with... Um, so, well, first of all, we all know that to be able to be on the metaverse in the future, it actually needs to be faster, and the hardware technologies needs to be cheaper, safer, and, um, you know, since we're all going to be relying more on, on the streaming of contents of everything. But one thing that I was thinking about was a lot of this is going to be on handheld devices, which means that we're going to be using wireless and both wireless at home, for instance, but also like 5G wireless. So what are you guys thought about that? So what is the biggest, uh, you know, uh, hurdle there? Um, so that's correct. Uh, we're we're going to be, um, there, there's always been, in the wireless world, there's always been a bit of influence by the traditional telco, the voice people who want packets to be smoothly uh, distributed and arrive in smooth order and so on. And then the the packet people, the internet people who are more bursty in their technology. So one problem we face with the metaverse is that you have both streaming where you want things to be smoothly distributed and you have bursty things as well. Um, what explain what the, what you mean by by bursty and streaming? So if if I were wise and went to a website like worldwideweb.uark.edu, uh, I would get a whole bunch of files get sent to me and images get sent to me and they would burst. They would come kind of all at once. I would want bandwidth that could handle bursts. But if I were listening to a podcast, I would want bandwidth that could handle regular streaming packets. Um, and the International Telecommunications Union has standards for that, the AT&T backbone. You may remember T1 lines and T3 lines, uh, frame relay, ATM, all the things that were kind of set up by the telco people as opposed to what we're seeing now, which is overlays of various networks uh, that are trying to enable both streaming as well as uh, bursty packet sorts of Forms of communication. Okay, I know we're getting a little, a little bit on the advanced. So let, let's break this down a little bit. When we talk about packages, uh, when I do a search, what really happens? I go from my computer and do a request, and let's say uark.edu, and I go into a specific site. I do a request, and then that site is sending me packages. 
um, what, how big are these packages and, and what, what would be the speed, for instance? Okay, so there's a lot of things that happen when you make a request of a website. Um, it may just be a text file that comes back to you. It may be something that triggers additional images. Uh, may con uh, The way Google Browser uh, work, they tend to go capture a whole bunch of things of what you might click on next. So they set up a whole bunch of files. Um, but you make a request, you as a traditional client, make a request of a traditional server. The server is going to respond, assuming appropriate credentials, uh, with lots of lots of files, lots of images, possibly videos, um, and they are going to send it all to you as fast as they can. Now, if you go to YouTube and you want to watch your previous um, podcast, uh, podcast um, what will happen with that is is it will send you things. It can send you things ahead of time and then queue them up and, and break them timing, or it can send you little pieces at a time with uh, commercials in between. Um, so... Sometimes you get streaming stuff, uh, we call that UDP, and sometimes you get packet stuff, and that's what TCP is for. And what we're building right now, and I'm working on this, I'm uh, doing it over Starlink, over satellite, is um, overlays that don't that lay on top of all the different types of networks your devices might be connected to, which would be cellular, cable, uh, traditional phone line, uh, satellite. Um, so how do you get a metaverse experience on top of each one of these things? And, and how are you receiving the streaming stuff on the highest bandwidth available and other things and, and other things that might be available? You, you may be somewhere that has five different uh, Wi-Fi connections. And how do you use all of them at the same time? You'd have to use a Lisp overlay. So we're building out that RFC, that uh, Internet standard, and it should be ready in about a month. So that is very interesting. Yes. Dan brings up a, a, a really interesting point about the techniques that modern uh, platforms use to, uh, I, I don't know how to put it better than this, but provide the illusion of high speed. Mm -hmm. um, they are predicting where the user might go next. They're, you know, within a game engine, they're looking at, oh, they're approaching this zone. Let's go ahead and preload all the images for this zone. On the website, they're saying, well, we might go to this website next, so let's preload pre some of these images to go ahead and make use of the bandwidth that we have and give them the illusion that we're moving faster than we actually are. Uh, yeah, that has to do with lo location. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're on your phone and the phone has a certain IP address and all that kind of stuff, and so now they know that you are here uh, and you're walking from this place to this place and your IP is still going to be safe so they can actually start streaming and putting mm -hmm. these things nearby where you are, which really speeds up. Uh, right. and, yeah, and that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I've read about that yeah. too. And I think that's going to be a big challenge with the metaverse if you have multiple people wanting to interact in a virtual space, you can't predict human behavior in the same way when you have a group as you can with one person navigating kind of a static website or a static, you know, yeah. virtual environment. And so it's going to be a lot harder for uh, for metaverse related platforms to be able to uh, to handle the the bandwidth needs when they can't play these tricks uh, to predict where you're going to go next and go ahead and preload things and make it seem smoother than it is. I, well, yes, in certain cases. But in other cases, I can also see if you are, uh, you know, we were talking about it, about the VR, the last uh, podcast, if you have a box and you're standing in a box and you're always connected and you do your shopping or you're playing or whatever in that VR box that you're playing, uh, that way the person knows uh, who you are, what you usually go and do, you, you have certain accounts for Walmart or whatever it is, and then so it can actually pre-package and actually load uh, that local uh, Walmart, for instance, in, in a pre-server somewhere in the vicinity of where you are, or actually even on the machine where you are. So all they need to do is to change whatever the products are mm -hmm. in that virtual Walmart, for instance. So that is interesting. But but I do know that um, I've, I've been in meetings with some people uh, talking about the wireless 5G network. Do, do you think 5G is going to be enough for people... In, in in metaverse? I mean, today it probably is, but what do you think? Today it probably is because we're probably used to speeds of 30 hertz um, for normal video. Uh, for full view of what a human really processes, we'd need 90 hertz. Uh, we'd also need 4K in each eyeball, which is a different type of hardware 
than what we have right now because we're typically a monitor is going to have one accelerator for graphics and now you need two accelerators for graphics and they need to coordinate and there's quantum effects and other things that uh, need to be taken into account. Now, I was on a call maybe two months ago now with a very large telecommunications provider and they called and said, hey, we've learned to tame our edge, the edge computing uh, within this environment. And they said they can handle, they believe, 12 million neural net inferences per second. And they called to see what I would do with that if I had it. <laughs> of course, I thought, That's really interesting because I do know that one of the things with like uh, VR stuff is just with the glasses is that you don't see, as a, as a, f a full grown human being, we can actually see on the sides, but the glasses won't give you that perspective. And today, uh, when you put the VR stuff up, you get a little dizzy because you don't have that perspective. But with that stuff, you can actually make glasses and see everything Real time. How many? How, how, how say that number again? One. Well, they can do twelve million neural net inferences per second. Um, and what we, I got some folks at Cisco Systems and Palo Alto Networks together to try to try to think about what would you do with that besides mine Bitcoin. Um, and uh, what we thought was, you know, one of the original people who created routing internet uh, routing information uh, protocol routing tables on the internet and also link state routing on the internet. So based on traffic, how do you route packets around? And with a computational effort like this, this would be enough to you know, simulate 36 qubit quantum machine, but it would be enough computing to actually do machine learning based routing. So as browsers kind of anticipate what you're going to do next, networks now have the capacity to calculate that, to figure out where you're going to go next based on other people being at the state you're at and the journey they took to that state, what are the probabilities that you're going to go to the next state? And the networks are going to be able to anticipate this and do reservation bandwidth a protocol using the edge computing as a network of estimating what's going to happen. So I think we're going to see pretty dramatic speed up between Lisp that sort of figures out of all the networks you can connect to, how do I coordinate them all? 5G, uh, cable, fiber to the house, um, as well as maybe some older uh, devices that are still useful, analog devices and so on. Um, so I, I think we're going to see dramatic improvement in uh, network capacity and our utilization and in intelligent networks. So Yeah, talking about fiber, actually, I was looking into silicon photonics their fiber techniques that, that was a very interesting so if you guys are interested in look up silicone photonics and you learn some more fibers but one of the things that you and i talked about in the last one was that uh, we see development let's say on on the on the router side right so in the in the old days a router that we had in the old days would not be able to you know connect into a fiber or a, the same modems connecting to fiber because there wasn't the capacity or the technology and the, the modems so we're seeing technology growing in different areas and as one gets better the other one has to 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 follow that suit right right so there's there's a stack of technologies uh and protocols that are required to keep traffic flowing and keep you know uh the the experience coming to the the end user and when one of those speeds up the other ones have to compensate uh, or they become the bottleneck um so yeah absolutely yeah i actually i have a, a good little example of that because i started noticing at home that my internet was uh, you know was uh, randomly just stopping and it was because my modem was buffering to a point where it couldn't send anything anymore so i called uh, my fiber uh, my, my provider uh, uh, and they said oh did you update your modem because it's fast enough so the modem needs to have an up upgrade mm -hmm. so that's one of those things that happens all the time well and also you really should understand how to configure your home router so that you get all the bandwidth and the children get less bandwidth <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's true i, I want to say about 90 percent of people that actually get internet they they just go with it, this this they pop in the cd or whatever it is and it's like oh yeah this works oh this is the password okay we're good to go but if you go in and tweak it a little bit and learn and trust me there's tons of really good youtube videos out there you can actually optimize your home internet to do exactly what you want to is it's it used to be uh, i i guess you could say it used to be rocket science but it isn't anymore because you know the, the, it's it's not that complicated anymore 
But, but one, the other thing, talking about that, uh, we're talking about the speed of how these packages can come to you and, and all that kind of stuff. But also one thing is uh, the, the, the video cards and the graphics, because the graphics are getting more and more complicated now. I mean, if you think about in the old days, it, it was pretty square and whatnot. And today, if you go and play a game and you look at the water or something, you can see how real life it looks but things like that is also needed to speed up right there are graphics accelerators that are being built right now for virtual reality headsets the consumer electronics show in uh, vegas if you can get recordings of some of the things that went out there earlier uh, i think it was earlier this year early january pretty fascinating stuff i mean they're, they're doing things now where they they have the mechanism to in a sense, give you an eye exam and adjust to your prescription um, without you doing anything. So your headset goes on and it, it figures out what's the optimal and, and adjusts the headset. But again, you need accelerators, virtual reality accelerators and both both um, graphics accelerators for both of the eyes and they have to coordinate. Yeah, But it's people, people um, are trying to get around the motion sickness um, of it. Um, as you guys talked about before, color blindness is, uh, I think, 11% of males, only about half percent of females, or can't tell the difference between blue and green. Um, to, but just just the motion sickness that comes from people who get car sick will also get sick in metaverse, and they think they can make the adjustments of the type of light you see such that they can avoid that, or at least... Do, do you also think it has to do with the hertz? I mean, because I, I can tell from my experiences that if I have a computer and I have a lower hertz rate, I usually end up having a headache. A lot of you guys probably have the same yeah. thing. You know, so what you do is increase the hertz rate. Uh, m maybe in the future will be a little controller where you can actually just increase or decrease the hertz rate according to what you might need, right? It's disturbing in a number of ways. Some become physical. Some you just find annoying. You know, <clears throat> if you're watching the Hallmark Channel and the voices are half second after the lips move yeah it, it distracts you and and you're no longer in the show you're, you're no longer being moved by it because you're distracted by this other thing yeah that is true because i was actually uh, talking to someone about that <laughs> that if you're in a in a zoom meeting and someone is suddenly you know it, it the words come out grab you know just rambling for a second or the pixie dis disappears you're okay with that but if you are in the middle of a game on your VR set or something like that, and suddenly this happens, we're, we're talking annoyance, not going to go there, right? Yep. Yep. So I would say uh, if you look at the, so I've got a thought on the on the motion sickness as well. But if you look at the consumer tech right now, that's kind of commercially available. Um, and, you know, Zuckerberg was ridiculed quite a bit with his meta announcement because of the, the quality of his avatar. But when you put on a standalone headset that has all the processing power, all the video rendering there in the headset, we're taking a significant step back in terms of the ability to compute and display uh, at high fidelity. Um, and that's, you know, it's it's a trade-off right now if we want a standalone headset that's connecting to the network that's not relying on high high power GPUs, um, that's not relying on, you know, extreme bandwidth between your local PC and your headset. And so we are definitely taking taking an experiential kind of step back. And one of the concerns is as we get more realistic, is it going to cause more issues with people getting dizzy, people being, uh, uh, you know, getting headaches? Is it a refresh rate issue? Is it a, 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 a vision issue in terms of like not being able to have peripheral vision? Uh, one of the other theories is that it's a dissociation between what you think your body should be doing and what your body is actually doing. And so to the extent that we feel like our body should be doing something more than it's not, that could be causing more motion sickness or more uh, VR sickness yeah. because as it gets more realistic, my body is, you know, maybe I'm just sitting here or maybe I'm waving my hands in a way that, you know, isn't what is being displayed on screen because that's the control to do this in an environment because yeah. I can't actually, you know, go skydiving. If I'm VR skydiving, that's, you know, how how's my body going to react? How's my head going to react to that experience? Yeah, exactly. 
So. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't actually think about that, but yes, that is very interesting. One one thing that I I, I have learned from a, a couple of people and meetings that I've been on is that a lot of these headsets, what they're doing now to speed up things, <clears throat> because we're talking about faster and so on, is that the, the ocular stuff or this is going to be more connected to your phone. Mm -hmm. And the phone is actually going to be the one that actually does the, the, the heavy lifting, mm -hmm. so to speak. And then your Oculus is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's going to be connected too. And they're talking about different ways of doing that, like, uh, you know, using wireless directly on your phone or even Bluetooth and stuff like that. And that means that Bluetooth also had to step up their game, right? Well, it's like how an Apple Watch might work right now mm. or the Google Glass previously where the, you needed an external power source. Um, because right now the Oculus can only run for two hours, but your Apple Watch, my Fitbit can run for four days. Uh, so if you do your processing externally, that saves quite a bit of battery usage for the actual experience you're going through. Uh, one thing came to mind, Jeff, as you were talking, is you know I'm I'm wealthy in the sense that I have good bandwidth to my house. You know I'm, I'm not wealthy because I'm a school teacher, but I'm I have good bandwidth in my house, and uh, that enables me to participate in this new economy and develop in this new economy where people who aren't wealthy would not be able to do that. So the the cost of having headsets that do all this processing really uh, keeps a lot of people out of this market, uh, both as consumers, but more importantly as producers. So content production is mm -hmm. being done by people with good bandwidth and people who can afford a $1,500 headset or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, so I, th I think if we could move more toward a cloud-based computation environment or even a phone-based computation mm -hmm. environment, um, I think that would uh, we would get a lot more diverse content. I, but I do think that we're going towards that. Like I said before, if I live in a certain area and I uh, want to go, I'm taking Walmart as an example again, I can load that load local Walmart on my phone. The thing is that the, the processing power and all that kind of stuff uh, on on a phone, uh, it has to be better and better and better. And that leads me into the other thing also is that with CPUs and, and GPUs also for that matter, at some point, we're going to hit Moore's Law, right? Where, 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 uh, so are we going to re maybe reach a point where we can't increase the speeds anymore? Well, there's a few things to keep us going down that road. Uh, if if you're limited by how many how narrow your uh, your electricity can go over a wire, we're we're coming upon that physical limitation. But you know we don't don't always want a you know a bigger and stronger mule if if twenty average mules can can uh, do things. So the ability to do things in parallel. There's some interesting things being built in quantum analog chips, and analog chips can be a thousand times faster than digital chips. Um, so that's being created. There's a company, AnalogComputation.com, that is uh, putting out analog chips that should be a thousand times faster than designated Bitcoin miners. Uh, well, for example. You, you also have the you know, neuromorphic computing. You know, uh, I was reading about dish brain and organic uh, organic I iodes. You know, maybe we're slowly moving away from the way we are doing CPUs today into more of that area. Do you think? Or, is, or are we get, getting into science fiction now? Oh, no, the things are being done right now. I had a conversation last week with people who put chips in people's brains. And um, you can use the processing, uh, and it senses brain waves like the old Clint Eastwood Firefox movie, right? Yeah. Uh, but all, all of the the human computer interface stuff that you hear about science fiction is probably being done at the, uh, the Human Machine uh, uh, Institute in uh, uh, Pensacola, Florida. Well, well I, I know there are people out there that are actually already now putting microchips in them, in their bodies so they can open car doors. Or mm. I don't know if you've seen that. I was watching a documentary about that. And I was like, okay, that's maybe a little far fetched, but uh, but there's technology in there that is is really fascinating. But I do think that if you are going to start going into those things, and obviously I I don't think I mean all of that's going to have to be voluntarily mm -hmm. done, you know. But but when you start doing things like that that will speed up things. 
We played at John Deere maybe 10 years ago with some of these technologies where you wire gummy bears, put them on your skull, and <laughs> wire them to your computer, and you think, you know, you train it. You have to train yeah. it just like any supervised learning algorithm of today. But you think, turn on the light, turn on the light, and it, it records that, and over time, you think, turn on the light, and your light comes on. Yeah, totally. And what they're trying to do is there's a lot of uh, knowledge in retiring farmers today, uh, far farmers that know you know, a lot about growing things, you know, which isn't always book available. Yes. And so if you can, if a 80 year old farmer who can't move around as well anymore can drive a combine or a tractor from his brain and know things about the field that nobody else will know, um, you can extend their enjoyment of farming. Yeah. And, and that is very interesting because the thing is that when an old farmer uh, and, and this is what we're seeing today is that more and more of the young people, they don't want to farm anymore. And the old people that are still there, they have all the knowledge and it seems to be dying out. So them staying on and not only that, all the information that they are thinking can be stored. You know, so that if someone, a grandkid in the future says, well, I want to do this, he'll go in and learn all those things that his grandfather actually by doing all of those things was stored somewhere. I, I know this is science fiction and we're going a little bit off, well, off tracks, but we're still there. This is 10 years ago we were doing right, this. Right. I mean, the yeah. technology is heading in that direction. And even if you're not talking about like the minimally invasive surgical implants or anything, um, there, there was a, a recent uh, experiment that I think was published in Nature um, that they've shown that brain to brain human communication can work. Uh, and they were basically had people on either side of a, a you know long range network that were that had the headsets on, and one of them was controlling a very simple Tetris like game, and the other ones were were watching to tell this person how to move whether to turn the block or not, um, and they were able to successfully communicate uh, via nothing but brain to brain communication to improve uh, you know this remote player's performance in the game. Um, like seeing this podcast, we're way ahead of everybody <laughs> very else. Very <laughs> simple right now. It's very basic, yeah, I know, but, but it's a start. But, but it's there, right? It's like 7% of your brain is mirror neurons mm -hmm. that fire in response to the people around you. Because we're social animals, yeah. and our brains are social. And, and yeah, so it doesn't surprise me that they, I haven't heard that they've gotten into that, but it doesn't surprise me because that's uh, how we're our connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I was uh, 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 re reading up a little bit because actually they're looking into mushrooms. The way mushrooms are signaling to each other is the same way as our brains are with the neurons and stuff like that. I want to, uh, one last thing. I mean, we're running out of time. I'm not sorry about this, but uh, sociable uh, accept acceptance. We were mentioning that a little bit. So can we delve into that just for a couple of minutes? Yeah, I, th I think the technology is, is going to come along pretty well. Um, I think the bandwidth issues, you know, in certain places are, are going to be better than others. Um, certainly favors uh, communities where there's denser populations or university uh, com communities. Um, I, I, I don't think those are going to be big barriers because I think we'll adapt to them like we did with cell phones. And, <clears throat> and our applications will get more needy and, and the technology will respond by providing more horsepower and other forms of uh, capacity. Um, but it still becomes a question of what do we want this to look like, as you talked about in, in Jeff's paper before. What do you want the metaverse to look like? Um, do you want it to be driven by certain companies, or do you want it to be driven by uh, individuals? Uh, companies tend to be better at user experience. Uh, open communities tend to be better at technology. Um, but it's kind of up to us. Uh, but societally, we have to have some important conversations about this. Um, I happen to be a fan of Facebook. Uh, I think their original product, uh, it was almost a metaverse sort of product in that you know you could connect with your high school friends who didn't know over the last 10 or 20 years that maybe you haven't achieved everything you wanted to. Maybe your kids aren't perfect like all the other kids, it seems like, in Facebook. But it allowed you to kind of go back in time to people you hadn't seen in 10 years where you kind of had a fresh start. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree so, with you. So it's it's uh, Facebook has really done a lot for the world, and you can't have a billion customers without ad providing some value. Yeah. So we we have to figure out what what we're willing to sacrifice 
in terms of privacy. I've read the Facebook privacy, the Oculus privacy policy. You should all read it. Uh, it does capture all of your voice, everything you say, like Alexa and like some other things in your house are doing. Um, you have to be comfortable uh, societally and individually of having somebody standing in your room listening to everything you say. And if you're comfortable with that, then they'll provide you an experience if you're not you know, but we, we have to society. I agree with you on that. Okay. One thing I do appreciate, though, there are groups out there that are kind of like the watchdog groups, right, uh, that are already looking into other things, consumers or whatever. And I think we're going to have watch groups like uh, watching over the metaverse because there are things in the metaverse that are really, really important that people don't think about. But what happens if you're a six-year-old boy puts on his VRs and starts walking around and ends up in an adult store, right? Things like that. Where where the ethics and stuff like that? And I, I, I agree with that. I also agree with you. I think Facebook is great. I mean, I started out with MySpace in the old days. I would like to see more spaces like that, though. I would like to see that, you know, people are not just only on Facebook, but because Facebook could... Once you have a thing like that, it gets too big. That's what I think. Yeah, just like websites. I mean, there's... There's reasons to have multiple because you can discriminate your marketplace into people who want different levels of entertainment or education. Um, I'm involved in a number of companies that do metaverse education. And it's not just to, you know, uh, interview and find out who can do this job, but it's do you enjoy this job. You know, if you're a bank teller, maybe from the outside being a bank teller, it looks kind of you know, looks like a pretty comfortable gig. And then you're dealing with people who are yelling at you. Maybe maybe it's not for you. Uh, but but you, nobody wants to hire or be hired into a position that doesn't fit what you're looking for and comfortable and aligned with your skills. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of reasons we can, in the training world, um, give people an experience and let them decide if this was kind of what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, there's there's just a lot going on in this space. It's yeah, and, and who knows? Your boss in the metaverse might not be uh, anything else but an AI. You know. Well, that, in a sense, think of you know, I've got grandchildren. What uh, what would I like to leave great grandchildren? I mean, mm -hmm. between generative AI and deep learning, deep fakes, um, I could record enough that they could capture part of my essence and. My great grandchildren could come into metaverse and find an AI copy of me, be ten years younger at and, least, and and have and have <laughs> yeah, and and have uh, real good conversations. And on that Correct. note, good conversations. Thank you guys so much for being here, and uh, always thank you for you being here. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye. See, see you. All.